Hello and welcome everybody. Today we are talking about investing in poker chips. It's just a discussion, not financial advice, entertainment purposes only. Everything I say in this video is my opinion, all right? Now, some things we're not going to discuss. We're not going to discuss becoming a dealer or distributor, okay? Or exploiting arbitrage in this video, okay? So you can go out and you buy a thousand chips and then you try to sell them individually on eBay, okay? That's work, okay? That's a side hustle at that point. So we're talking about very specifically, because this is only a four college credit hour video, college joke. What I'm trying to say is I want this video to be pretty short, okay? Like very short. So we're just going to talk about long-term holds. So buy a poker chip and holding it for more than two years up to, you know, whatever, 30 years, 50 years, whatever it may be. Are these good investments in that sense? It's interesting. There are some points that I want to discuss and there are lots of points that I'm not, there's just so much to it. So let's discuss a few things here real quick. And let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Now this real quick, I, I just grabbed this as a prop. This is a Metallica Hard Rock Las Vegas Casino chip. You know, do I think this is a good investment? I don't know. I can't tell the future. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. It just happened to be convenient and it's something I can use as a prop. Now, it gets tricky when you're talking about investments. And since this is part one, okay, we're just going to talk about investing in general real briefly. An investment is taking on risk with the idea of making a profit in the form of whatever. I mean, you can go use credit. You can go into debt to take on that risk. You can sell uncovered calls. You can just write uncovered calls all day. That's a lot of risk. With poker chips, you know, if it's an obsolete poker chip, it's purely the sentiment and how popular that chip is going to be. And if it's a current chip, then it's guaranteed the face value because you can just go to the casino and just like, you know, go to the Bellagio, you buy a $5 chip, and, you know, for the next, as long as they use those chips, you can just go and get $5 for it. So it's guaranteed at least $5. So what, you know, value does that have? So the questions arise. It does an obsolete casino chip match inflation? It's a tough question. We, I don't have an answer for that. So for example, let's say this just, these are all hypothetical examples just so you can see my point. So let's say inflation is, I'm going to pick a number here because there are people in the future who are going to be, I don't know what the inflation, I don't know what inflation is going to be in the future. Okay. So just as a general discussion, let's peg inflation at five percent okay and is this going to increase more than five percent and it will depend on the chip all right so as an example one of the negatives so we're going to talk about some of the negatives as i see it and some of the positives of investing in poker chips so one of the negatives is keeping up with inflation in addition to that it's the transaction costs of dealing with poker chips in the stock market world we can just go on robin hood or wherever and make free trades is the big thing nowadays in 2021 okay so i can buy and sell stocks and there's no fee and there's no commission involved there. It's just, I can do it online, on my phone, easy to do. And with poker chips, lots of times, there's still a transaction cost. I'm just gonna use eBay as an easy example. eBay is a huge marketplace for used casino chips. So let's say I buy this for $10. Okay, let's say in a year it goes up to $20 in value, all right? So I buy it for $10, but wait a second. The transaction cost costs the buyer money, so you have to pay $3 in shipping and tax. Let's just say you spent $15 for what's listed as a $10 poker chip. So your cost basis, $15. And let's say it goes up to $20. And for the people who haven't done this before, they immediately think it doubled in value when it didn't double in value because your cost basis is 15 so it's only up, what, 30% or whatever. And so let's say you try to sell it for $20. Okay, you get on eBay, the new buyer pays $20 plus shipping plus tax, but you get $20. Yes. Oh, wait a second. Stop the presses because eBay charges you 15% transaction fee, which is what, three bucks. So your $20 is now $17. And let's say that your shipping materials are free. You know, the seller paid for shipping. So you, just, you know, for whatever reason, you just have access to free packing materials. 
And so, great, you know, 17, so you make $2 in a year for your chip. Is that a good investment? And then, but there's something else that people don't talk about with transaction costs. When you have a transaction, you have, especially with a sale, you have a taxable event. Oh, great, so now the IRS steps in. You say, your oh, my cost basis is $15 and I sold it for 20, but here are my eBay fees and so I made $2 and they're gonna tax you on that $2 at whatever your tax bracket is. Let's just say, it's. I don't think that 30% is one, but let's just say 30%, okay? So you're paying 30% taxes on your $2. Whoop-dee-doo, all right? So you're paying 60 cents, so you're down to $1.40. $1.40 is what nine percent let's 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 just say ten percent so you, you made ten percent off of your initial fifteen dollar investment is that exciting you know ten percent for how for what an hour's worth of work so basically you spend an hour of your time to make a buck forty you can see where I'm going with this the transaction cost is just destroy, and if you scale it up, right? Obviously, so if you have a thousand dollar chip, it's going to be different, and that number still might grow. But think about it like this: if you can get through those transactions, with what, you know, for a large scale thing, you're and you're making ten percent, you're doing pretty well, because for me personally, I invest a lot, and my goal is eight percent or more. I don't have these unrealistic expectations of I'm trying to five hundred x my money. Okay, it's just. You know, I'm not trying to win the lottery, I'm just trying to invest my money. 8% is great. Beats the bond market at the moment. The bond market is not great at the moment. And does that beat inflation? Yeah, you see, inflation's pretty high right now, but in the future, it could be beating inflation. So they could be viable, but those transactions can be so time consuming and the transaction fees and the hassle of taxes and stuff. So long-term holds may be better because you can let this increase in value over 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. These are my thoughts. And you'd be fine. So kind of one of the things. The other problem with like holding collectibles is you have to hold them. Yeah, you could get a safe, if you have valuable ones, you could put them in a safety deposit box, no guarantee. You know, you're gonna pay for insurance on them, then all of a sudden you have a maintenance cost. And so if you're spending 2% of the value of your collection every year to insure it and maintain it, then you're losing that 2% every year. So, you know, I just have these concerns, you know, and then if you don't have them insured or you don't have them safe, you just have them on a bookshelf, they're small, you can hold a whole bunch of these in your home. In a bookshelf, what happens if there's an earthquake? One of those, one, you know, one of those beams in your house collapses and crushes your poker chip collection, you're out 20% of your collection and that's a huge loss, could be, depending on how valuable your collection is. Do you see my point? What about fire, you know? Is your health insurance going to pay for the collectibles? They'll pay for a part of it usually, but if you have like a million dollars worth of poker chips, how much of that are they going to cover? And so you can see how there's, you know, some concerns if you're big into that. Now let's talk about some of the positives real quick. I'm just glossing over a lot of this. There are lots of little things we could discuss, but for the sake of time. So what about the pros? All right. One nice thing about this is it's unregulated. Does that make sense? Like, as an example, if I, if you own a controlling stake of a company, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw Bill Gates under the bus, okay? Bill Gates owns a controlling stake of Microsoft. Huge amount, okay? that's where all his wealth is. Contrary to popular opinion, he can't just liquidate that like that. He can't go and tell his broker, hey, sell all of my shares. Because the, the SEC, the, they have regulations about how much he can sell. And I forget what it is. Last time I looked, it was like really convoluted. It was like the rolling volume average over a 52 week, you know, period of the volume daily is the max that they can sell or 2% of something of the total volume, you know, and so they limit how much they can sell. So they can only liquidate a certain amount. So that way they're not driving the stock into the ground and they can't do these manipulating things with all of their stock. So it's regulated, but with poker chips, it's not. So if you know that there's only 10,000 of a certain chip available, like like pick a Cincinnati, like a horseshoe, like an old obsolete Cincinnati horseshoe. If you know that there's only 10,000, you know, $100,000 chips and you just buy all of them, 
then you have a monopoly and that price is whatever you set it at, right? So if you spent, you know, $300 per chip, you can set the price at $500. If somebody wants that chip, they have to pay your price for it. And so that's one of, you know, are, do I think it's easy to get a controlling stake of poker chips, of classic poker chips, of obsolete casino poker chips? It's hard to say, but it is interesting. It's an interesting point and something worth mentioning is that you can do whatever you want and you're not limited on how much you can sell. If you want to dump the whole collection in one auction, do it. No SEC meddling here. The other nice thing about the poker chips is I like them. Hey, my video, my opinions, back up. But we're talking about investing. Yes, we are. But when I invest in stocks, guess how often I look at them? Never, never. Okay, maybe occasionally. Okay, I need to go back to regular. Have you ever experienced this? Let me know. You're holding a stock in your stock account and then all of a sudden money gets withdrawn from your account. It's like, wait, what's going on? How come my stock, how come I'm losing money on this stock? And you look and it's like a transaction. And this has happened to me personally. Organization is reorganizing. This company is reorganizing and who are they, who's paying for this reorg? The stockholders, this guy, okay? And so they're taking money out of my account saying, oh, we need to reorg our company. Take a loss on that bad boy. Thumbs down. Guess what? A poker chip? Metallica, the Hard Rock Casino Las Vegas, isn't going to ever come after me because I hold this chip and say, hey, we're reorganizing. We need, give us, give us a hundred bucks. Never going to do that. So again, back to regulation. It's nice that it's not regulated. All right. What were we talking about? What were we talking about? Okay. I like these chips, all right? So this is my thought process, okay? Now I'm not a chip investor, but I wanna have this discussion because I invest in other things and I wanna know if these are viable investment vehicles and we can talk about this in the comments below. When I buy a chip, the first thing I look at is do I like this chip? That's legit the first thing, like this is awesome. You know, Mapes, uh, Hard Rock, Bellagio, Caesars. Shania Twain, Celine Dion, Britney Spears at Planet Hollywood, pick one, they're all awesome, all right? And I'm like, I want, I want, and I'm gonna buy as many as I can. That's my first thought. My second thought is making videos because I like, it's fun making videos. And so that's how I'm thinking, like, this is awesome. And then after I get it, I'm like, hey, I should make a video about this. And then I make videos about them. And then my third and final kind of like back of my mind, back burner thought is, I wonder if this will increase in value. Oh well, and it goes in my collection. And I look at them and I enjoy them. That's a great thing about poker chips is you can enjoy them however you want. If you want to stack them and shuffle them, you can do that. If you want to put them in little slabs like I do and show them to friends, you can. It's fun, it's easy to do. So for me, that's one of the joys of the idea of investing in poker chips is they're a fun collectible. Now, that said, with investments, how much is that gonna sway your decision? It all just depends on what you're passionate about. The other question I have about this is, you know, obviously the supply demand curve, you guys know all that, but what drives demand for a chip? It's not just scarcity. It's usually a desire to find the chips as well, right? And so like big names like Caesars, you know, command a high, Flam the Flamingo obsolete chips demand a premium, the Dunes, you know, because they are memorable for a lot of people. So what drives the value of those? Is it YouTube videos like this? Is that it? Forums where people talk about obsolete, rare obsolete casino chips? My point is that it's a slow, it's a very naturally evolving market where there's a kind of a very solid base of interest that doesn't fluctuate wildly like the sports card world, right? The Last Dance is coming out, Michael Jordan and everybody, you know, we have an extra, you know, 30 million people who are all of a sudden jumping into the market. I want a Michael Jordan rookie card. Oh, never mind. I want a Michael Jordan card of something. And then, you know, it, that doesn't happen with poker chips. They're not coming out with Metallica. Even if they do come out with like a Metallica documentary, people aren't, the first thought on people's mind is usually, let's go buy the vinyl. Let's go buy some Metallica. Let's go listen to Metallica you know, on Apple Music or wherever, they're not thinking, oh, you know that 
Hard Rock Casino, they made a Metallica chip, let's go out and buy that. That's not how it works. So it's an interesting market for poker chips. It's like people who like poker chips, that's it. And then you'll get some people that kind of roll into this and find they like poker chips and they're introduced to it and it's new. It's not like huge fluctuations. So there's some stability that can be seen as a pro or a con because you're not going to get wild, wild swings and you're not going to get like, you're not going to have the bottom fall out, right? Or it's like, no, we're not interested in these chips anymore. Let's just give them away. Okay. So let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I'm interested to read what you're thinking about poker chips as an investment. Like I said, I'm just scratching the surface in part one here. We may dive more into it in the future, but specifically, I want your opinions about individual, obsolete casino chips as long-term holds. That's the question for this video. Thank you everybody so much for watching. Thank you to my patrons for your support. Really appreciate your support. You can get on Patreon and it's just general support I like to post a couple behind the scenes pictures or videos every month. That's about it. And if you also want to support this channel, you can visit my Amazon shop. I'll put a link in the description below. I am an Amazon associate. I make proceeds from qualifying purchases. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe, comment below.